Welcome to the Fashion is Cool podcast. Today, our guest is salon owner Dominic Pertani, who owns Dominic Michael Salon. We will dive into the beauty industry and fashion business with Dominic to inspire others who are currently salon owners or future salon professionals. So we will learn from Dominic on how the whole process works. How are you today, Dominic? I'm doing great. Dwight, thank you so much for including me in this project. I really appreciate it. Good to see you. Oh, yes. This is going to be a fun project to do. Um, and you were one of the people that I've known for a long time and has made fashion cool and has made St. Louis uh, definitely a fashion capital. I appreciate that. Um, all right. So let's get started. Can you tell us about your journey in the fashion and beauty industry and what inspired you to open your salon business? Okay. Well, initially, um, I had some exposure to, uh, you know, the people that were cutting my hair. Right. And, um, I, I patronized this very hip place called the divine miss M. It no longer exists, but, um, I was just fascinated by the process. Uh, my father is a carpet, was a carpenter. And he and I did a lot of projects. So I had my manual dexterity was pretty developed. So the, the, I, you know, watching what they did and, and how they worked, I found fascinating. And, um, I was one of those clients in that beauty salon that, um, asked a lot of questions. And so I ended up going to the beauty school that my hairdresser went to. And when I came out of school, I went to that salon and they said, I applied for a job. And they said, well, you have to have a license. And I said, well, I, I have it. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, I went to school. I went, I went to his school. And they, they said, we thought you were the most peculiar client with all your questions. And so they ended up hiring me, right? And so okay. that was one of the big, you know, that was where I started at the small salon in Creep Corps with a group of people that I really liked. And, um, you know, progressed from there. I, 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 I went to school with the purpose of learning as much as I could about the beauty industry, because up until that time in my life, a little guitar, a little soccer, a little of this, a little of that, I could do nothing well. So when I went to the cosmetology school, I thought I'm going to really immerse myself into this craft and come away with what I can, the, the maximum amount of information that I can. <clears throat> then working in this small salon, I gathered a lot of information and experience. And I, I quickly saw that, you know, there there's, what I wanted to be a part of was the biggest, best, and most uh, recognized salon in the city at that time. So I applied for a position at that salon, worked there five years, continued to develop, observe, lots of observation. I learned good lessons. I learned things I would never repeat. You know, I, I, I tried to grasp it all. And, uh, and then one day I struck out on my own, basically out of frustration because uh, my then employer liked some of my ideas, but not enough of my ideas that I thought, you know what, it's time that I implement my plan. And so I took out a small loan. And when I did that, my, my, <clears throat> I was very aware of how much money I could produce with my own two hands, right? So my costs of buying this old salon for $13,000 and fixing it up, figured the fix, fix up money. And I opened my salon on a budget that I could support with my own two hands. I didn't need other employees, in part because uh, I never managed people. And uh, having my own space was project enough. I needed to do that for about a year before I could add people, and before I felt comfortable adding people. And uh, interestingly enough, um, you know, one of the things that set me up for that stage in my life was I had spent during that observation period I mentioned just briefly ago, I would go to the leading salons around the country. I'd call and ask them if I could come and sit in their salons and, and, and observe the, the process, whatever I could see. And they, most are friendly. They say, sure, come in. So some of them, you know, I didn't take a vacation for three years that wasn't to a beauty salon just in Atlanta, New York, Chicago, LA, you know, pick the, pick the city, uh, bigger, you know, no more noteworthy than St. Louis. And I was in the best salons in those towns seeing what they, why were they were getting press? What were they doing that was so special and trying to bring some, integrate some of that into what I was doing. And um, so with that information, it helped facilitate when I opened my own salon. So that was uh, some of the very first steps I took. Very cool. Um, 
what sets your salon apart from others in the area? And what do you believe is the unique value proposition that you <clears throat> offer your clients? Well, I, I think that what sets us apart are, are basically uh, three things. You know, one is, is our, the passion we have for the craft. So the people that work at Dominic Michael really like the craft of hair, hairdressing, hair styling, hair coloring. They, they like skin care. Those that do these other disciplines, the skin care, the nails. We are predominantly, mm -hmm. however, a cut color facility. That's, that's what we are known for. And the people that work there have a passion for the craft. That's the first part. The other part is the facility. I've always tried to build uh, beauty salons that, that look credible, that have uh, a stylish, uh, in, they look, I think, different than most salons in town. And that, that was on purpose, right? So that when you arrive, you think, well, this is nice. You know, what, you know we tried to have that knee-jerk response as you drive up <clears throat> from the curb and once you enter. So we've got that. Then we've got the passion of, of the people in the space. And, and then we've got the, the, um, the thirst for education. The people that work there are constantly seeking best practices. They, they implement best practices. There's a lot of pride in the staff. And it's interesting. We'll, we'll bring in someone new, right? And, and uh, I can't be there all the time, right? Um, and, and, and then I have two salons, so I can't be two places at once. But people will say to me, my staff will say to me, you know, so-and-so over here, you know, we're not sure. They out the person that unless they pick their game up. I mean, if they aren't on par, if they aren't playing at the same level with the same intensity, they don't want them on the team. So it's a very interesting dynamic, you know, a lot of pride yeah. there. That makes sense. That's great that you have a good staff because you can't be everywhere. And that's, I think that's some uh, business owners struggle with that. Um, trying to find the people that will allow them to take a, you know, a day off or get away uh, and trust them as well. Mm -hmm. It's a big trust. It's a, it's a huge trust factor to trust your staff to be able to run your business that you started that, you know, you're very passionate about. You're trying to find people that are just as passionate about it as you. Exactly. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of pride. It comes down to pride and professionalism, mm -hmm. really. And, and the, you know, I'm fortunate that I have uh, a collection of people that share those values. So that's what it, I think that's a big differential in, in my salons compared to perhaps others. All right. That's good. Uh, how do you stay updated in the latest fashion trends and techniques in the beauty industry? Can you share some of your favorite sources of inspiration? Well, I am very proud of my membership in an organization called Intercoffure. It is a uh, one, it, it, the United States is one of um, 40 member countries based in Paris. Uh -huh. uh, there's only 250 salons in the country. And so it's, it's really about best practices. So, you know, the, the leading salons in other cities um, will share, idea. we meet three times, four times a year, and we share best practices. In addition to that association, which allows me to really, I have, I have access to some of the very best hairdressers in the country, just pick up the phone and call them. They're, they've become friends, I've been a member since 91, so I've, many of them have become friends. You know, in addition to that, um, four times a year, we have visiting educators, and these educators are provided largely by uh, the brand of L'Oreal Salon. So they're the best L'Oreal educators, and they come four times a year. They'll bring cut, color, and they also bring uh, – there's, there's a couple of other things that they can bring in, which are soft skills. You know, soft skills with dealing with clients, uh, approaching clients, making the best use of, of the, the client interaction, aside from the technical side. So we get a pretty well-rounded educational experience throughout the year. That's now, very cool. In addition to that, you know, we've got Zoom and, and we've got so many different kinds of information on the Internet. So we can follow, you know, very famous hairdressers in, in any city. I mean, I happen to like France and I, uh, in particular. And there's some just great people and they're constantly putting their work out there. Uh, and so there's a lot of information, you know, as you know, that we can get for free if you're interested. Yeah. yeah. Is there anyone that you can think of the top of your head that you were inspired by? Someone you yes. saw? Her mm -hmm. name is Anna Pachito. She okay. is a resident of Montreal and she is an absolute 
master. She is beyond gifted. If you were to follow her, Anna Pachito, she's okay. uh, really incredible. That's awesome. I'll have to follow her and check it out. Yeah, check it out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, can you talk about, and we talked about this before, can, we talk, can you talk about the importance of community involvement and engagement for your salon? Are there any local events or initiatives that you're passionate about supporting? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> yes. What we have done, uh, just to bring up to date, we have, we have adopted families. We have uh, worked with Bridgeway. Bridgeway is, uh, is, a, is a rehab facility. And we've, for men and women, we focused on the female side, the women's side, because you know, these women are emerging and uh, their self-esteem issues. Uh, so you know, hair and makeup, we, we, we help them feel better and look better as they try to get back into their normal lives. They try to get jobs. They just try to emerge you know, feeling better, feeling stronger about themselves. So we work with Bridgeway. In addition to that, um, Mother Model Management, a group I know that you're aware of, has a couple of entities. One is called Model U, and as in Model University, where they work with young, uh, aspiring women who have hopes and dreams and aspirations. And so uh, they come in and we work with them with uh, hair and makeup and photography. Uh, some of them get their dreams fulfilled. They, they, they get bookings. Some of them, there are a variety of avenues are open to them by the model you experience. And we work with them. Um, there's usually five or six of them a season. And for the last couple of years, we've been involved with my mother and these young women. It's great to, great to see them. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm a big fan of mother and, uh, Jeff and Mary, of course, I've known yeah. for a long time. So, yeah. uh, I know they're very passionate about model you um, yeah they just elevate young people that's what they do yeah and that's great speaking of the next generation what advice would you give someone looking to start their own salon or fashion related business well i think if you have that entrepreneurial fire you know inside it's something you know it's a it's a big driver and so i would never uh, dissuade someone from from following that dream their dream uh, I would caution them that, as an example, for years now, uh, consultants on a, on, a glow, on a national level have been saying there's too many beauty salons. There are not enough hairdressers. You know, I mean, I don't know any beauty salon. All of my colleagues, all of my friends in this city and other cities um, have, have uh, space for new people. They're looking, they, they would accept new, new talent, right? And mm -hmm. they're not. At one point, you know, you, you, we would turn people away, essentially. But um, so I would tell them that to go cautiously. If you're going to go in the hair business, I would approach it cautiously and I would approach it small. I would look at the budget. I would really do a, a, a complete pro forma and really look at the costs and expenses and um, make sure that you're able to cover and, and be, be uh, profitable. It's, it's challenging to be profitable out there. Mm -hmm. And a mentor wouldn't hurt. I had a mentor. You know, I, my mentor wasn't a hairdresser. He was a businessman, but he helped me a great deal. So having a mentor is a great, a great thing, right? Right. Yeah, I think being a creative, having a mentor that is a business person is probably helpful because uh, you want to focus on the craft. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very... It's a, it's a very um, a tricky landscape uh, mm -hmm. because I didn't go to business school and, um, you know, I, I couldn't read a P&L when my, uh, I opened my salon and my accountant gives it to me. I, I, I couldn't read it. He explains it to me. I get home. I couldn't even tell my parents because I already forgotten, you know, but I would bring it to work and my, my, my the guy cut his hair, Bob Wilson, who's a saint. I, I love Bob Wilson. He's deceased, but he was, he was so good to me. Um, he would explain it to me. And, you know, I don't want to say the number because it was really low, but he says to me, he says, what do you want to do, Don? I'll go ahead and say the number. I, I, don't, I don't want to talk about money. He, he said, well, how much, you know, what do you want to do, Don? And I said, well, I want to earn X. Now, on today's scale, it's a very small number. It was in 1982, right? Hi. When I was working, right? Hi. And so, and he said, okay. And so he helped me get to that number, you know, over time. And uh, he, he was a, a lovely man, and uh, but he was strictly... Uh, business. He, he didn't know anything about hair, right? So uh, mentorships are very valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple of mentors and I, I talk to them, you know, monthly 
you know, um, it's, it's very important to have those people that are, uh, you can lean on and get support from and get ideas from, especially, you know, if you're a sole owner of a company, you need someone to kind of bounce ideas off of and, and, and kind of hone in on what you were, uh, you know, ex an expert at and get more advice from someone else. Yeah. Objectivity is not a bad thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I've had many of my mentors tell me I'm doing it wrong, right. <laughs> and, that, and that's okay. That's okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you share any memorable experiences or success stories with clients that stand out in your career? I, I can. Um, I, you know, you said clients, but I, I'd like to say, include staff, if I may. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the first. The very first thing that happened is one, one day, one of my uh, original, uh, kind of calling the founding staff, right? The first five is a small salon when I first started. There are 80 mm -hmm. people that work there now. But the first five, one of the founding five came to me. We hired them out of school. She, she learns our practices. She starts to work, builds a clientele, and comes to me one day with a piece of paper and says, would you fill this out? It was an application for her to buy a house. And I thought, my goodness. Here's a kid came from school with a license. We taught her, she built, and now she's buying a home. That's a full circle success for me. It was just fantastic. I felt so great uh, for, for being a part of that. Although she did all the work, I felt great inside, right? Um, so now getting on to clients. You know, clients, uh, funny, Beauty Salon is a funny ecosystem. So uh, specifically with, with, you know, the new salon. Well, I'll get, this story has to do with Chesterfield. So I opened Chesterfield and people come in and they do this. They look around. They, it's an interesting. Okay. I like, you know, I'm looking around, checking it out and they go get their hair done. Well, <clears throat> when these women would return the second, definitely by the third, third visit, you'd see them walk in differently. You know, their posture was different. They were walking into their salon. You know, they, they, they warmed up to it. It was their place. It was the place they go. And you see that and, and you go, Yes. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. You want to make an environment such that they're comfortable, they repeat, and you can just see the expressions on their face and the body posture. And the other yeah. was when the new salon in Ledoux, it was bigger than, you know, we moved, we got a bigger facility. I, I looked up one day and, and every chair was full. Every, every crap, every hairdresser that worked there had a client in their chair and they were full. We were full. And I thought to myself, my gosh, this is, the, this, is, this is the first time I observed it in that salon. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what a, what a benchmark, what a landmark, you know. And, uh, you know, that was a personal high. So I've, I've been fortunate to have, to have observed, to participate in, and uh, to be the recipient of uh, some high marks as a result of the beauty business. I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, that it probably is a wonderful feeling when you have people come into your place of business that you built and they have a smile on their face or they're in awe of what you just did, or they're very they embrace excited. It. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, and, and while I don't like it from time to time, people put their feet up on the wall and I say to myself, <laughs> ouch, you know what I'm saying? You know what that is? You know what that is really? They're that, they're comfortable. Yeah. I was going to say they're, that. They're yeah. comfortable there. You know, that's, that's really what it is. And I yeah. say, okay, I got more paint. I'll touch it up. No big deal. Yeah. You know? But but that's yeah. something being really comfortable, and yeah. uh, you know what it, it is what it is. I want them to be comfortable there. Yeah, yeah. You feel like family, right? You know, yeah, like your family. Okay. You know, I got touch up paint. Keep coming. Back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, what are some of the challenges you've faced running a salon, and how do you overcome them, if there's any? Well, I, I alluded to staff, and I also mentioned there are 80 people that work there. But staffing is an ongoing regular challenge because there are these statistics in the beauty business that 50% of the young people you hire out of school don't stay for some reason. So, you know, so there at the early, at the, at the entry level, there's a, there's turnover, there's, there's interviewing, there's, there's a selection, there's a, a recruiting, you know, that's a challenge. Recruiting is an ongoing challenge that you're engaged in with all the schools in town. You want to have a, a recruitment team. That's a challenge. Uh, on, on the other end, you know, you want to, um, to keep people satisfied, right? To, to, you know, how about long-term employees, right? 
what's the career path look like? So we have levels and these levels have to do with pricing and commission and there's there's a journey. So someone comes in and they, they're trained when they hit the ground on their way to buying that house, if you will, there, there are these levels that they pass through so they can chart their progress through the company and uh, <coughs> keeping them on track, making them aware of that. However, the single biggest challenge that I encountered was COVID. I was blindsided like you cannot believe. Um, I, I've been doing this for a very long time and I did not want to stumble at the finish line, but that blindsided me like nothing, nothing else. And uh, it was a challenge to get through it, to comply with um, everything, you know, all, the, all the mandates. I mean, from spatial to hours, uh, staffing at 80 people, you can only use 10 at a time. Remember, you get 10 percent, 25 percent, all of that. That was a Rubik's Cube of challenging, of challenge scheduling to keep people happy and help them. They had to earn a living. So that, you know, there's, that was an unsuspected challenge that we emerged from successfully. Thank goodness. But I would say that, that staffing is the biggest challenge, which is why I cautioned the new owners to open small. You don't need a lot of people. Keep your budgets low, open small, you know, have a, a slow pace to your success. <clears throat> and your staffing, they, they come from the schools in the area. Is that right? Most of the schools, um, the, the top schools would be Paul Mitchell, um, <clears throat> T-SPA, which is the professional academy, the acronym is T-SPA, uh-huh. and um, CRAVE is another school, uh-huh. and the Grabber. So there are four schools that we recruit from, and I think most of the salons in St. Louis look to those four schools because they're the leading, there are others, but these are the leading schools. Uh-huh. And uh, we all, there's all kinds of students there, right? I mean, there might be 200 students there. There's some for each of us because everybody wants a different culture, different, different location, different style. There's, there's enough for everybody, but you've got to be engaged on a regular basis uh, to, to be a consideration because these, these young kids, um, they are, um, you know, they're seekers. A lot of, most of them are employed by the time they graduate, right? They've already made yeah. a connection with the salon when they graduate. So yeah, they. Uh, I've been to Paul Mitchell uh, a couple of times, and those students are hungry. Yeah, you know, you know, those and students I, are I really think that's hungry. a credit to the schools because uh-huh. that that's why they're a leading school. Uh-huh. They they've got a culture where you know I'm sure these kids look at the various schools and they say I'm going here for a reason. You know, yeah. They, yeah. It's, yeah. All right, so you have been involved in a lot of fashion shows, including uh, St. Louis Fashion Week, uh, Tribute, and the um, the Wash U Fashion Show you've, you've, you've been a part of for a very long time. Uh, can you walk me through how you prepare for a fashion show and what happens the day of show? So basically, someone calls you to ask you to be a part of this show, and then the first model walks on the runway. So what happens in between that? <laughs> okay. Okay. I've got two, two, two answers. One is the WashU. Okay. We have done, uh, been participants in WashU for about 38, 39 years, a very long mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Um, that, it, that collaboration is very nice. Um, what we do is we meet uh, a couple of times with the students while they're developing their designs uh, for various types of review. And um, and then they have here they have they give us mood boards. Every student has a mood board. Every student has a design and a vision, and we're given these mood boards to uh, replicate on their models. There is a press shoot in advance of the show, where many of those looks are executed for the the imagery. That's most of the time imagery is in the, the brochure. You know. Uh, we, give at the show but uh, there's lots of uh, of opportunity to work with the student and really execute their vision and find out what they like we do it they say no it's too high it's too you know we, we collaborate and we get to a place so the day of the show it's executing that particular look because we've walked through it now i have to recruit a lot of staff to do that because uh, wash U is I think last year they had nine students. It's a smaller show. They'll have nine students with, you know, seven models. And you can do the math there. Uh, Tribute is a monster. It's a big show. There were 65 models last year. 
And it's a much different kind of show. It's uh, the models, many of them coming from out of town. So you don't have a chance necessarily to meet them. Now, because we've done it for multiple years, we have some overlap so that even though they're working out of town, we've become familiar with many of the models that are in the show, most of them, in fact. The other thing is with Model U, working with Model U, some of those students, are, uh, some of those models are developing. They, again, show up in the tribute show. So we've touched their hair and we're familiar with their hair. But <clears throat> there are two mood boards. The looks, with regard to the looks, there's a mama and a papa. Guess who mama and papa is? That's right, Mary Jeff. Okay, so there's two, <laughs> there's two looks. And um, everybody in the show gets one of those two looks. So our task is to look at the mood board. Uh, a, my task is to assemble some staff. And then we practice how to do these things, these looks. And uh, now this year we took 18 people with 65 models. And um, we do our darn best to you know, replicate the looks and get them out looking the way Mary and Jeff envision. Now, Mary and Jeff have an executive uh, assistant named Jenna. I know that you know Jenna, and Jenna is a big part of the op operation. I'm, I'm constantly in communication with Jenna, right, <clears throat> about uh, the back of the house where the, where the looks are happening. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's in a, both of the sh shows are different types of adrenaline rush. You know, I kind of like the adrenaline rush. I like the, and my staff that participate with me are, not all the staff members want to do it, but the ones that see the opportunity for uh, internet content, I mean, social media content, uh, portfolio work, you know, those are the people that are coming with me and giving up of their free time because it is, uh, you know, you're, you're donating your time. You're, it's, you're in pursuit of, of uh, you know, your personal fulfillment, your personal goal, which is, uh, you know, perfecting your craft outside the, the salon world, the you know, salon world is pleasing clients. These other things ha have a more creative uh, opportunity, really. Is it, uh, is it crazy during the show? Are you doing touch-ups in between? Yeah. Well, yes, it can be crazy during the show. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's usually backstage, there's just one or two people because you can't, I mean, they've got dressers, they've got models. Uh, you've got models uh, changing clothes, so you, you know you're really positioning yourself. You know, you know as they they change as they walk through, you're touching up and they walk out. So you're right, you know, behind the curtain, if you will. Um, you're not back in the, in the prep area way back. We prep the hair and makeup somewhere else. The dressers are, have their own space. So once their hair and makeup's done, then they move to the clothing area, which is much bigger and right behind the stage. So yes, there's somebody to do some touch up. Yeah, because it falls so hard. It, things get messy. Yeah. yeah. And so roughly how many hours did it take you to do 65 models? We arrived, arrived at 1 o'clock, uh, arri arrived at one thirty for load in. We were ready at 2, uh, shows at, uh, you know, 7, but, you, you know, you got to have them ready by 7. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <clears throat> there's a lot of rehearsal. If, if You know, I, I know I s saw you there you know mm -hmm. um there we were prepping hair while they were sitting on the folding chairs uh what we were doing is just spraying their hair uh, getting it uh dirty if you will so mm -hmm. that we could iron it and and so uh we were <laughs> following the models around for a couple of hours because they have to rehearse there's last minute rehearsals there's last minute uh change me they want to you know uh, wardrobe run throughs and so it's uh it's a little bit hectic but yeah. uh it's it again it goes back to that adrenaline rush and uh it's all part of the all part of the game yeah yeah this stuff is exciting all right so we're going to step out of the world of fashion and i'm going to ask you a couple of other questions uh what is your favorite food food yeah do you say fruit food food <laughs> yeah i i i love italian food uh, dominic mm. bertani yes um, of course however i i have uh, developed, you know, a taste for red and green chili. I spent a lot of time in Santa Ooh. Fe in New Mexico. And, you okay. know, New Mexican cuisine is its own. It's not Mexican. It's New Mexican. It's its own cuisine. Right. And uh, I, I adopted a taste for that as well. All right. Yeah. What is what is your favorite animal? Oh, my favorite animal. Currently, I have a new puppy. <laughs> so I'm going to oh, go. Okay. 
<laughs> I got one for Christmas. Yeah. Oh, uh, very cool. Yeah, a, re- a retriever. So a little nice. retriever. But my uh-huh. favorite animal, I have to tell you, I think of all the animals, I love the owl. Oh, I love okay. the owl. Yeah. I think owls are fabulous looking, you know. Yeah. And they're fast as heck. And uh, I, and uh, it's uh, an owl. I like, I, I, like, I like owls. I had an owl. I lived in um, out west, you know, almost in town and country. And it was mm-hmm. this owl that, you know, nobody, n- no neighbor owned it. But there was this wooded area. And we all, we all knew it was there. And this owl hung out there. And we all loved it. You know, you know. I hated That's to move, I, I move out away from that house because I gave up my owl. You know, but I'd see him all the time. Hear him a lot, but see him, hear him very often and see him a lot. It's like that. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen an owl besides the zoo. Yeah. No, I mean, they're, they're majestic. I think, yeah. you know, you know, they sit upright and they've got those things, you know, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Uh, last question, your favorite vacation spot. Boy, my favorite vacation spot. I spend a, time in, in New Mexico. I love mm-hmm. New Mexico. I love the mountains. Uh, I love to hike. Mm-hmm. And uh, I find that to be a very, you know, they call it the land of enchantment. That's their slogan. And the joke is it's the land of entrapment. And so <laughs> I, I spend a lot of time in New Mexico. I do like nice. the beaches though, you know, yeah. and who would reject Italy? I mean, I'd like to go to Italy once oh, a week, you know, yes, but, uh, I love, it's, yeah, there's I would so love much to, to see out there. I would have yeah. to say New Mexico and Italy tied for first. Do you get a chance to go on vacation? I mean, owning a business, is that well, rare? Well, yeah, I do. I do. Um, a couple of times a year, L'Oreal sponsors trips, mm-hmm. and they almost make you go to interesting <laughs> places. You know, yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll take you to Italy or they'll take you to Paris, because fashion capitals. Um, yeah. If I go by myself, though, you know, I still, I've still gone to, to uh, you know, places like, you know, Spain. I love, you know, beautiful um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know, but I used to like to go to the Caribbean, but I've kind of stopped. I'm, I'm back to hiking. I love to yeah. hike. You know, I like to hear, right. I, and I'll, I don't mind hiking alone. I like to hear the wind through the pine needles because it goes, Shh. you know, it's just, you hear the sound of the forest is fabulous. Right. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. I like it out there. Well, I guess I'm around cool. so many people. You know, I get out there, I hear the crunch of the, my boot on the gravel, and then I hear the streams, and then I hear the wind. It's, pre- it's I like it. Yeah, that sounds pretty peaceful. It's nice. Actually, yeah. 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 I like it. Well, thank you, Dominic, for joining us today. Uh, you definitely, like I said before, you've, you've always made fashion pretty cool. Um, you're a cool person, and I enjoy talking to you today. I hope you uh, had a good time. I did. I appreciate being included, as I said at the, at the beginning, you know, um, my uh, b- becoming a hairdresser was one of the very best things I could have ever done. It yeah. opened my eyes to so many things. And um, I've, I've met people that I would never, ever have met in my chair. And I met people around the world connected to my craft that I would never, ever have met all because I went to that hospitality school that my hairdresser went to. It started right there. It was like five hundred and fifty dollars. I forgot to mention my tuition was five hundred and fifty dollars. I got all of that for five hundred and fifty bucks. And look at you now. Well, you know, I mean, that's very kind of you to say that. Thank you. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, I, I mean yeah, definitely. I mean that's 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 a that's a good investment on yourself to where you, you are you today. Yeah. yeah. I mean schools now are you know twenty two thousand or something. Yeah. But we know things go up. But but yeah. in retrospect, for five hundred and fifty dollars, it you know I got it changed my life, and I'm, yeah. I'm grateful for it. So I enjoy talking with you. Thank you very all much right. for including me. Well, thank you, thank you for being here, and thank all of you for watching and listening. And we will see you soon. See ya. Bye bye.